Welcome everyone back here to Siegel Talk. I know we have a quite, a quite a lot of them this week, but this is a very important and a significant one we think here at the Siegel Center. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the director of the center and I'm actually in Guadeloupe at the moment um, where we collaborate with our friends following up on our Caribbean um, theater project, Caribbean um, uh, uh, citizens of New York, uh, actually the largest immigrant group. They're not really represented on the stages and the minds and their stories and uh, we make a small contribution to connect and reach out to this truly important part of the world we actually have a talk tomorrow about uh, uh, the history of the blacks or histoire du negre as they say here politically slightly incorrect uh, based on the text by Edouard Glisson and created in the round with drums and uh, using all traditional indigenous um, um, theater forms with us today we have I think uh, one of the important thinkers um, of uh, theater, global theater, uh, with us is Florian Malzacher. He's a curator, a writer, a researcher, producer, and um, and he's going to talk about his book, his new book, which is new in English, at least we helped also to publish this. It's with the Alexander Verlag. Florian, welcome. Where are you? What time is it? Well, like, thanks a lot for having me. And hello. Yeah, I'm in Berlin. It's um, early evening. 6.30 p.m. and the sun is uh, shining, which is not necessarily the case in Berlin. Yeah. So um, tell us a little bit about the book. I know you you uh, wrote it and it came out shortly, I think, before the Corona time. And um, now we looked in a way to get it published in English. I think it's one of the important observations actually on contemporary theater. Um, like uh, Thomas Oberander, uh, who we also had in our program, you uh, Florian, also somehow outside academia, but you generate ideas, you generate uh, uh, thoughts, uh, you connect uh, uh, things uh, um, that uh, perhaps are obvious, but we don't really see it. Um, and uh, uh, and I want to know how, how what have you done? How did you work? How did you come to write this book about uh, the political and the political theater today? Well, um, I would say in a way it's a kind of like, maybe not a resume, but a kind of like looking at things, how they developed uh, over, I don't know, 10 or more years where I got interested like many others in the questions of uh, how political, how theater can be political, how art can be political, you know, after the the square occupations in, in, in Tunisia, in, in Egypt, and then Occupy Wall Street, and, and, and uh, for so many artists, the question arose newly. I mean, it's not a new question, but it has to be asked again and again in different ways. What is the relationship between the artistic work and the political situations we, we are living in? Uh, and um, this also spread into theater, and there was a new interest in, in rethinking political theater and in theater as assembly and so on. So for me, it was kind of like, you know, after basically like 10 years or 10, 11 years looking at it, what had developed, what has happened in this time and how has political theater changed? Because I think it kind of like took a new, again, a new form and a different form than it had uh, in, in, in years before. So that was the kind of the reason to do it. And as you said, um, yeah, strangely enough, it, um, I mean, in English, it's called the Art of Assembly, and, and it was happening. It was published in German right at the beginning of the pandemic, so basically on the day. <laughs> so, so in the moment where nobody would assemble, where no theater would happen, and that of course gave it even more a little bit the feeling of uh, looking back at something, and maybe less at being in the middle of it. So it was an, a strange moment, but in in the end, also an interesting moment for uh, for me because it kind of made all the uh, Caesar. In, in the timeline, of course, and and, um, and we don't know what all has have, has changed or if things just continue like this. So, so and then at the end of the pandemic, uh, the hopeful end of the pandemic, it's coming out in English. So that's great. And that thanks so much also for your help with this. Yeah, actually, almost the day when the uh, at least in New York a City and also the U.S. you know end the mandate for a wearing mask. And Florian, you're also well known as a curator and you create also the Art of Assembly Talks. Uh, to, and you made a number of books on theater companies you admire and you very closely studied their work. Tell us a little bit about that work, what you do. Yeah, for me, like, yeah, curating projects. I mean, I used to be a, uh, also a director of festival or co-curators of festivals. Uh, and in recent years, more was, was more working on on 
on projects uh, and, and, and series of things. So for me, the curatorial work was also always related to writing about things and thinking about things, maybe also because I started off as a journalist. So I kind of had the desire, I guess, to kind of communicate also a little bit uh, what, what is the artistic work that is engaged. And as I said, in recent years, my interest also as a curator was very much connected to the question of how art can be political, how theater can be political. It basically started um, a bit more than 10 years ago uh, with the project still in Graz at Steirische Herbst Festival called Truth is Concrete, which was in the middle. It was right after Occupy, but in the middle of all these political events still where we invited hundreds of activists, act, uh, artists, uh, theorists to discuss the, this relation between art and politics. And from this came other projects, uh, Training for the Future together with uh, the artist Jonas Stahl, or the series, The Art of Assembly that you mentioned. Uh, where it's um, about having conversations a bit like like you do it in, in a way, uh, having conversations with different artists, theorists, and activists about questions of assembling in, in art and politics. Mm -hmm. How many talks have you done in the art of, of assembly? Uh, oh, well, I cannot compete with you. We have uh, yeah. 23 talks so far. <laughs> but still, this is a remarkable number. And for our audience to remind you, there's this we are now talking to uh, someone who was a curator who studied theater, uh, who has seen a lot, um, talked to, to many significant uh, people, also contemporary theater, as uh, we, we now like to, to say the world we move in contemporary art. And it is a condensed uh, now version of, of what your experience uh, was in that uh, field. And I like your uh, insistence in a way also to think about as theater, not as the political theater, but as a theater about the political. And it's important, I think. And um, Matthias Lilienthal wrote, you know, since Hans Thies Lehmann's uh, uh, post-traumatic theater book, this is perhaps the most significant uh, observations on, on theater, um, uh, listening to artists. What Lehmann always said, I said, we observe artists, theater artists, and then we create a theory that might fit around it, but it comes first, the theater. And I think, uh, this is what you do, and perhaps that's also why it is so important and successful and different than um, than um, other books who might not be as close with the ear to the field. Um, let's start uh, uh, from the beginning of your book. In Germany, it's called Gesellschaftsspiele, Parler Games. You call it here the Art of Assembly, um, which I think is a great title. Um, you uh, um, talk about the new world we live in, the new era, the end of history. Uh, Fukuyama, you, 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 you quoted and Chantal Mouffe, um, where you say, um, we are moving in a new territory in art and also theater has to react to it. Um, and you focus on that term agonistic pluralism, which sounds a bit complicated, but it's a great concept and it's a very, very important concept, I think, and I think it has answers for all of us who are in theater, writing about theater, watching theater, but also especially creating theater. Yeah, this, I mean, this comes from uh, uh, the fortunate situation that I could have uh, several conversations with Chantal Mouffe, the Belgian philosopher who created this term, uh, this concept of, uh, of um, uh, agonistic pluralism. And uh, what it means, I mean, yes, it's a complicated concept, and of course, but when we put it in a nutshell, it says that there was an age of, of consensus in politics where it was said there's no alternative to anything. So we have to do like this and this and this, which is related to this idea of end of, a his, end of history. So we, so certain opinions were not possible to have in a way. And, and the, the Chantal Mouffe says, it's it's important not to have consensus in society in, in democracy. It's important to to have uh, um, struggles, to have fights about ideas. Uh, because if you if you don't allow these struggles, what will happen? They will turn into not agonism but antagonism, which is basically a clash or a civil war or something like this. I think some situations in the U.S. or in Brazil or whatever are reminded uh, reminded of that. So 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 she says like democracy has to be an arena where adversaries can compete with ideas. And, um, and I found it interesting that, that um, this is not necessarily a pleasant idea. It also brings the question, what, what do we accept on stage or in all societies and whatnot? Where are the limits to it? So it's like, a, of course, it's also not a limited freedom, but this, this need for, for 
uh, for, for conflict also on, uh, in society, I think very much related for me to theater, which is always a medium of conflict, you know, like the, if, it's, if it's different historic characters or people or later than um, wife and husbands on stage or even inner conflicts within a person, it's, it's all about often, or most of the time I would say about conflict. And the term agonism comes of course from, 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 from the Greek, Agon, which was a competition of arguments in the Greek tragedy. So, so, so I think it's also related by this. And that's the kind of like a, um, a idea that I thought interesting that theater can be, can provide sometimes these, these arenas uh, for, for political uh, discourse, for political discussions, for, for disagreement also, and um, how that looks in different parts of the world. And that means also that theater is not, this, the theater I'm talking about uh, is not a theater that just observes and represents and and like you know like a represents situations like maybe in a in a certain kind of director's theaters of the seventies where it was very much about representing the dilemmas of the world the conflicts of the world. I think the the theater that I'm writing about also wants to directly engage and create situations, not represent situations only, but create situations that are political in themselves. Um, and by this becoming this kind of agonistic arena. So it maybe starts a bit earlier than the most people I'm talking about with the German theater maker Christoph Schlingensief and, uh, and uh, work in Vienna where he um, really brought in the conflict in the city where there were fights on the streets and discussions and so on because he was restaging a kind of a big brother uh, game uh, with asylum seekers that could be voted out by the, by the people out of the country. Uh, and and uh, of course uh, created a lot of lot of discussions, and continues to many other works all over the world up to I don't know Milo Rao and and uh, and other works that kind of like create the situations of engagement also for the for mm -hmm. the audience. Yeah, just to um, to to come back to it, this kind of radical idea, and perhaps on most of the really the truth uh, of the matter, um, say there will never be a world without power structures you wrote there they will always be special interests there will be people fighting about space about money about uh, material goods um but we have to find a way to balance um, this out and um, there will never be a paradise as the living theater hoped in paradise now is that it's just around the corner the big hope of marxism there will be a paradise on earth the workers paradise and this idea say no actually this is not um how uh, the world works and functions we just had andreas weber the philosopher with us who said it will always be more like a biological uh, a state of the world, wild, it's chaotic, are the unsur un uh, surprising things are happening and um, in um, theater, as you say, and as Mouffe says, is a place, is a public space where we can address these political issues, social issues, personal issues, with a set of rules, you know, that it is, um, as you say, not antagonistic, but uh, you can present a case like lawyers, like we will talk about later, these ideas of parliaments and, and, and trials now in contemporary theater, but theater can be that place where society, a city, a community, a neighborhood can look um, at itself. Um, do you uh, feel that this is a, a dominant trend in contemporary theater? The political well i think it, it it has been a dominant or dominant i don't know but an important trend and, and maybe not in in all theaters but it has been has been an important trend and uh, it also a bit the game changer i think for, for for many many artists um to to kind of reconsider what political theater means and 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 on the other hand of course i mean i'm i'm showing confrontations and conflicts on stage or enabling them with, with a set of rules is one thing. On the other hand, there's of course a desire for safer spaces. There's a desire that not everything is possible on stage. And, and this is, I think, not necessarily, I mean, this sounds like a disagreement. That's something to negotiate. And because of, of course, there's also, there are different interests and, and different needs. Uh, um, so, so that's, I think in, in very recent years, of course, this question came more into play. So, so, so what kind of, uh, opinions and 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 views should be visible on uh, in theater and in society in general 
and, and which shouldn't. And this is difficult to answer. And, and it's not that I'm saying like, oh yeah, everything should happen. But uh, I think it needs to have an awareness that conflicts don't going to go away or certain positions don't go away by by uh, ignoring or forbidding them. So so I think this is the kind of negotiation which in very interesting ways is, ha is happening. So, so I think uh, also, of course, the, the agonism can be something that happens between stage and audience. So, you know, like it, it might be, it might be the desire to create a safer space on stage, but it might be a confrontation with, with uh, people that are confronted then in the audience with certain um, uh, stories uh, and experiences that they might not want to have that close. So this kind of agonism can happen in many, many different ways. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it is quite an, a significant and really important, uh, uh, um, um, uh, as you would say, uh, um, duty of the theater or possibility and perhaps also a reason why to do theater at all, to create in a public place these kind of uh, 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 agonistic uh, ideas. I remember Michael Frayn once was at the Siegel Center, the great British playwright, and he said, in a good play, everyone is right. Um, then you know it's a good play, but you look at the thing and hopefully then the audience will be able to make up their minds to see that we do live in contradictions um, and that nothing is in that way black and white and that the people who tell us that the world is black and white are the ones who are lying to us. Um, you wrote uh, the world will not only be shown in theater, but it will be shaped by theater. Of course, Miller Rao also says we should take action now. So do you really think, uh, what is the influence of, of theater? I know you work in Europe, you see European context. That's also what you talk about in your book. But um, do you think theater still is, is shaping in that sense? Or is it what you say is we have to redefine and get into this arena of agonism to, to find our place again? I think this this claim is more modest than it sounds because, of course, obviously, I don't believe that the theater play will change the course of the world, uh, <laughs> like like uh, other political actions might might do. Um, but I think if, if when we talked about that that in, in a certain kind of theater situations are not only represented but are created, it means it shapes this part of the world at least. It's already at least shapes somehow the the experience of the people that are in there, not only as as um, passive witnesses in a way you could, and I am interested in works that that like like for example what what uh, Judith Butler wrote about um, assemblies famously about Occupy Wall Street that uh, these assemblies are performative in a way that they create a reality yeah? like you know, like like a, in, yeah that, that they not only uh, uh, are they important because they protest something or they have certain claims but they try already to to, to have a different kind of being together. And, and this is, I think, uh, 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 the way that theater as, as the form, which is always somehow collective, where people have to come together, um, is, is, is like the, is the unique selling point of this art form of, of, of creating realities. So, so, and by this, hopefully, of course, also have some impact on the environment, depending on the work, but not, not by a big claim. And then tomorrow, everybody will follow it, obviously. And I think maybe it's important to, to also mention um, even, even if in a lot of this theater that I described, they are not actors on stage. They are the protagonists are, um, are the, 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 like in the trials or, or parliaments that you mentioned. These are people with their own claims on stage. So it's not, it's not also there's not a representation by an actor. But, but at the same time, I think it's important that it is, there's a difference between an assembly in theater, parliament in theater, and, and a court in theater, et cetera, and, the, and the real court outside of the theater. And I think that's important to also stress because that's the specific potential, I believe, uh, in a, being very Brechtian here, that the theater has. That it, that it's always real and symbolic at the same time. That, it, that it's uh, always fictional and, and, and true at the same time by, uh, the fact that real people are coming together uh, and at the same time it creates a narration. So we have this even in the most conventional theater, of course, like, you know, like we, have, we all know the guy on stage is not really Hamlet, it's whoever, and, and we can do this double take. But I think this, this double take has especially the potential to kind of bring us in a situation that is real, 
but enables us at the same moment to kind of reflect on it, to understand it, to analyze, okay, what is actually happening? What are the conflicts here? What are the hierarchies uh, happening? And, and this kind of double take being in and outside of a situation is the specific feature, which is a little bit related, of course, to like Brecht's alienation effect and other. Mm. Yeah, I, I like what, what you said also that you say political theater is always a social practice, but always self-reflective. And because it's self-reflective, you say there's a chance in that. Could talk a bit what you what you mean by that? Well, I would say it's um I think the question of self-reflection relates also to this, this discussion between content and form and in a very simplified way, and of course being unjust to many uh, theater makers. I would say there was a form of political theater in the 70s and 80s uh, uh, dominant, and which is the time where most people maybe still would say that was the real political theater. As we said, where it was about representing representing the 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 bads of the world and the the evil of the world and the uh, the political struggles of the world, and um, so the focus was very much on the on the what on the topic. Uh, in, in this representation, uh, and I think this had a reaction to like uh, uh, which is uh, in, uh, related to the to the rise of po post dramatic theater, as you might call it, with Lehman, um, where suddenly there was a big interest in the how of of the of the work, in the aesthetics, and, and and there was with Rancière and others in the idea that basically the main political impact, the main politicalness of of an artistic work is in the in the how in the aesthetics in the form and not in the content and i think this was very helpful in the, in, the, in the struggle of balancing it but at the same time also led to a lot of work i would say at a certain moment where the the term uh, of, uh, the, the concept of the political the concept of politics both and was like becoming quite empty because then you know like at a certain moment everything could be political because it, it was if it's only about the form of it and the certain moments of irritation so then there was another reaction to that again and i'm not saying anything of this was wrong it's, it's like everything is theater is always in its time huh? so so there was a moment for something else again and i think the works that i am interested in and that are um, described in the book i uh, try to just see the how and the what as necessary in a political work. And to, so it's not only about talking about political issues, but also finding a form of representing it that is political and bringing this together. And um, so that's in the, that's in the core uh, of, of, of these, these questions. And um, um, now I, I think I, I know that I said it because of your question, but I don't remember how to bring it back to, no, no, no. to, to what you said. No, it is. But also, I think that's the is, that's the core. It's quite a big, big statement, and it's also, especially also in American theater, something to realize that the how you represent the aesthetic forms uh, you find and the way you produce actually, you know, is as important, if not more important, of what it is about. Like an end reform in Panama, child soldiers in Africa. Say, how do theater companies produce their work? Um, are they aware? Um, uh, you know, of the, uh, of, of, of the effect uh, um, and what it does have in this highly symbolic space, what we do. So um, you say one of the big changes in that political theater and theater is political, no longer just if we, you know, write political slogans on posters and recite them in chorus, but uh, in the way you do it, how good is it if it's organized by a dictatorial uh, director who mistreats the actors, doesn't pay them, um, you quote Rene Polish, right? In in uh, in in one quote, when he talked about what he didn't like uh, in 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 theater that actually is reproducing the existence uh, we live in, is reproducing actually is a model for the state for the powers who are uh, do, not creating things that are working. The things that are not working, but on this theater, often things get represented. And that's already a Brechtian idea. We also said in already in the, sh the short organ on, uh, as we said, like people in the audience, which is the people in a way, uh, experience theater as on, on stage, uh, which is not which is not changeable. So society is not changeable by by them. So that's how, how it functions. That I would say Polish um, uh, um, relates in a way to that. And that's what you what you say is very important. So I'm 
it is about the how of the performance, of course, the relation between the audience and the stage and, and, and what kind of like reality do you create there. But of course, it's also important uh, what happens backstage, what help happens in the production uh, field. And that's a discussion, obviously, that we have in many parts of society. Now, it's not, it's not enough to just produce a work which is great or politically correct. It's also about how it is achieved and what is happening behind the scenes and, and, and that you have to, that this has also an, maybe an aesthetical impact in it. Of course, that's, that's something that a lot of theater makers now are very concerned of. And of course, a lot of the theater makers that we are talking about, in the book, I'm talking about in the book, are um, also um, trying to find other organizational forms in, in the way that they are collectives like Shishi Pop or uh, other groups that 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 uh, also really try to have different working models uh, beyond the system of a director and and his or her actors. Yeah. Yeah, I think your, your book really points out that we entered also in theater, you know, uh, a new phase. Um, people say, what's going to come after um, that idea of the post-traumatic, the brilliant idea that they are still there of Schechner's performance uh, theories. But I think uh, you're, you're, you're highlighting um, um, the significance of theater in these new ways is uh, something we say, yes, there is something has changed and you put your finger on it. This, we live in a post-fundamentalistic world, you know, calling, you quoted um, Oliver Marchard and, um, and you said it's no longer good enough um, to have, as you call, simplistic moralizing uh, 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 tales on stage. Um, we need an emancipated spectator, you know, and uh, quote Rancière, and you say um, something has happened. And I like that you quote theater artists in all along your book, that the big part of your book is about the work and describing their projects. For anyone who wants to get a view on contemporary European theater or global theater, You, um, you did with the book. Before we maybe talk about the artists, you also, I like that quote, Achel Mbepe, who you quoted, and you said that emotional blackmailing in political Frank, I'm not, either I'm gone or you're gone. I don't... I don't know who is. Am I back? Uh, I think I was yeah, gone. Yeah, you're, you're back. You were gone for a I moment. Must uh, have yeah. been the the, the 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 Caribbean internet here in Guadeloupe, which normally is very good. But you the 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 um um. Mbempe, if I said right, who said, you know, we have to look differently at how we discuss ideas, how we do things. And I think you quote him, actually, it's the longest uh, quote in your book. Maybe talk a little bit uh, about it, um, why you feel um, that um, radical agency um, is not about sharing borders. It's about putting down borders and not feeling, you said, you're purer than your neighbor. So what, tell me a little bit about his ideas and why do you think they're important and theater makers should know about it? Well, I mean, there's a chapter on identity politics and related issues, which are of course very important in theater at the moment. And I think it's, it's, very, it's very difficult so I'm, I'm a, because there are many, many very um, necessary and, and obviously um, um, important uh, demands also towards the theater to represent uh, other stories, other characters, other ideas, uh, and and to 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 get out of certain hegemonies. So 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 that's very clear. On the other hand, um, the, the 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 question of who can represent whom on stage is is very tricky for theater because of course in the end it's always a representation. So it's a negotiation. I'm not. I'm clearly. Um, may, may I think making the book very clear that I don't think it's a good idea for everybody thinking that they can represent anybody. That act, an actor, I don't know, that the uh, that the white white male actor, to to use the cliche, uh, can just represent whatever they want. That's not the point. No, the opposite. I would say. Uh, on the other hand, 
we will always get to a point where it is about understanding and, and bringing in other ideas uh, on, on stage. And this is a very di difficult issue. And I find what member writes about it is very, very helpful because he kind of also balances this of, uh, of the right to, to say like, no, listen, you have to shut up now and, 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 and listen. And on the other hand, keeping an interest in, in different stories and, and in, in, in um, and allowing art to try to bring in um, a different point of view. So, so it's a bit, um, yeah, it's, a, it's maybe less, less easy to say, but I think it's an important aspect to, to navigate for theater because theater is of course very essentially hit by this discussion because it, it's always represents something as much as it should create something, it's also representing something. So, so I think, it's important to acknowledge that we will never get out of representation, neither in democracy, I believe. I mean, some, some people disagree, but I would say um, with movement market and others, again, I would say, you know, representation will always be important in, in, in society, in politics. But I think also in theater, it will also be about representation. And we have to look at it carefully and, and, and have these discussions and fights and, and, and find the path there and it will be and it's already very different than it was five years ago and that's good but it will also change again so we, will, we, we have to see how it, how it develops mm -hmm. so maybe also for our viewers we let's talk a little bit about the productions and artists um, you you mentioned um and uh, describe a little bit by you felt um they are part of you know Juliana Rebenteich said you know we live in contemporary art <clears throat> at the moment, um, <clears throat> the modernism, the postmodernism is over contemporary art, and she quotes Obelso and Berto Eco and many others as Arte Aperta, Arte Mobile, um, that we live in a new, different time. And I think these artists who you quote um, um, also, you know, are trying something, you have found something. And I, I like that you <clears throat> have them in the center, as I said before, and that you try to comment on it and and carefully uh, um, you know um, create thoughts around the body of work uh, of these artists one of the ones you talk about is about Mittelreich by Anne-Sophie Mahler was a play done in the Münchner Kammerspiele and um, and another director came in and did something with it tell us a little bit yeah but I'm I also thankful for mentioning because now we talk about theory all the time and I hope the book is actually trying not to to uh, to um, uh, explain art to theory, but bring theory in where it is in, in, in relation to artistic work and it's actually also used by the artist. So it's a, it's a good shift here uh, because yeah. I think it hopefully gives the wrong idea, uh, idea that we have been talking so much about the theoretical part. Um, no, uh, the, the, the work Mittelreich that you, that you mentioned was a quite an important work, I think, in the discussion in, in German theater on one of the biggest stages in, in Germany at Münchner Kammerspiele. Uh, as you said, there was an existing work called Mittelreich, by, uh, which was uh, uh, based on a, a novel by the by, uh, autobiographic novel by the actor um, uh, Josef Bierbichler. And it plays in a Bavarian family after the war, after the, the Second World War. Uh, and um, is about these fears of this family, uh, fears of the future, but also fears of refugees, actually German refugees coming in from, from, from uh, um, Silesia and other parts of, of former Germany. And what happened is that Anta Helena Recke um, took this play one-to-one -one and replaced the all-white cast with an all-black cast. Uh, and they otherwise didn't make any changes. It was the same, the same uh, set design, the same text, the, the same costumes, everything was the same. Stage Just movements the also the same. Yeah, as much as much as possible, uh, uh, exactly. So there was so as as little as possible changes, uh, just a black cast. And and this, of course, like you can say, is is a is a classical strategy of appropriation art uh, um, of Sturdivant and others. Uh, and uh, and it really created a. A very amazing show because uh, um, it made very clear, it made obvious that there was no no people of color on stage before in this performance. It, it but it also brought all kind of double readings: the precariousness of the or the felt precariousness of the of the family on stage, the the talking about refugees, and all these things came came up, and it created a beautiful show, very powerful show, but also huge discussions in the German feuilletons uh, about this work. 
with sometimes uh, quite embarrassing reactions by some of the journalists that then were about the, talking about trying to talk instead about the qualities of actors or whatever and not really getting any point. Um, so it was also, as I said, it was a work of appropriation art in a way, or a tradition of appropriation art. It was also a work of institutional critique, which is not happening very often in theater, which is also interesting. I think like why it's a visual art genre uh, in theater, there are not many works of institutional critique, I would say, uh, some more recently, but, but not so many, because it of course talked about the cast, the ensemble of the of the Michener Kammerspiele, which which didn't have black people to perform in there, so they all had to be guests. We talked about the audience, who is in the audience, and so on. So it became a conversation about the theater itself, also. So that was a, I think, a very very important and very much discussed moment in in in, in German theater. And of course, one has to remember that the, the German situation here is very different from the U.S. or the the British situation, where uh, also, a lot of post-colonial topics were addressed very late, uh, com comparatively, and now are arriving or have been arriving in recent years only in the in the public discussion. Yeah, and and also they didn't have any black actors, you know, in the in the ensemble anyway, so they yeah. had to, you know, go outside. Yeah, it was all guests. See. It was it was was all yeah. guests. So that was part of the. I mean, this all was part. This all this conversation was part of the show. So the show was was there, and it was a, a an, an impressive show. But it was, of course, also the show didn't stop in the. It, it, it show, the show was also then in the after talk or in the in the discussion in the feuilletons and so on. It, it, it continued there in a way by raising all these questions. Yeah. So it, like a very simple idea and. Exposing also the apparatus, I think, of theater and the expectations and um, um, and all of it. Um, you you talk also about the work of Shi Shi Pop, um, um, an ensemble um, um, that um, is also trying to work in a different way. Maybe talk a bit about their work. Why you why do you think that is, their work is important? Well, for me, the work of Shi Shi Pop is maybe important in a different way. Their work is mainly important for me. I mean. In one way, in their early works, they experimented a lot with participation and confrontation with audience. That what that's one thing. But I think more important is that this is a group that exists now for almost thirty years, or maybe thirty years now. I don't know. It's around thirty years, uh, working as an ensemble and uh, as a, as a collective, working with changing roles. Like uh, like uh, there's no director, but somebody might direct and be inside outside. They they even in the beginning and they change a little bit where it was important for them that they would also do all the administration, all the other work around, or if somebody else would do it, that they also would be on stage. So like that there would be really a shared a shared work on it without, uh, without hierarchies. They even now in recent place, or since a couple of years now, uh, make performances where they can replace each other in different shows. So that's not even one role in there that only one of them could play. So, so uh, and, and and in their work and in their uh, trajectory over 30 years, you can see that uh, collective working is not easy, of course. I mean, it's like a re redefinition all the time and, and, and having an aesthetic and artistic um, um, demands at, at the same time. So it's like not their, their job is not being a collective, but the, 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 it's the job of the collective to create artistic work. And that I think that's why they are really an important example for many younger groups also in, in the way how they work, but also how they on stage represent themselves, their group, also now a group of women that are in their in their 50s by now, um, uh, like uh, addressing very often all the questions of what does it mean to be a, a woman on stage, uh, what kind of representations and idea go, go along with that. Um, so, so I think they are really a key, key group, a key collective. In, in a German speaking scene, mainly, of course, but uh, I think also beyond. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to mention some names and maybe we can go into some of them who you mentioned, you know, Rene Polish, uh, the Gop Squad, Lula Arias, uh, Rimini Protocol, uh, Quarantine from Manchester, um, Oiseau Mouche uh, from Paris, uh, Creation Ephemere, the Polish Theater 21, Aura Switzerland. Matt Werk from the, the Netherlands, Jerome Bell, of course, and many, um, many, many others. And you talk very clearly um, 
about um, their their work. For example, can I ask uh, the Dutch Mart Werk? I don't know. I haven't heard. T tell us a bit what they is are that? actually. I mean, they are actually really just mentioned. I'm, I'm talking yeah. about Batora in, 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 in terms of work uh, with yeah. uh, people with, with cognitive uh, disabilities and uh, and uh, how this uh, and uh, so there are several uh, several companies, of course, in the world uh, working uh, doing impressive work. Uh, I focus a little bit on the on the Swiss theater Hora, um, which did the work with Jerome Bell, which was interesting, okay. I think. Uh, and it's a bit an older work, which is maybe also important to mention, because I think also there have been developments. But at this moment, it was for Jerome Bell as a famous uh, cho French choreographer, uh, uh, quite a challenge to work with a company that um, had different ways of working, different ways of, of obeying him as a choreographer, for example, by also ignoring him or doing things that they wanted. And he chose at that time uh, in a beautiful show called uh, Disabled Theater, uh, he chose uh, to basically put a dramaturg in, on stage, which, which was always giving, uh, telling the, the, the orders, the director's choreographer's orders he gave. Jerome Bell said, do this and this, uh, show a solo and so on. So it was always clear, okay, there was an attempt of a hierarchy. On the other hand, the performance of Hora are so so strong and so so powerful and also so um, strong minded that they often ignore it or they 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 do their own thing with it and there's uh, so so it was really about questioning the rules of of, of theater uh, as as we usually perceive it um, and and the work is more than ten years old so so of course it was also the beginning of something but it's interesting that Jerome uh, said. Um, that he always considered himself to be a, a theater maker that breaks rules and, and challenges rules and so on. And he, that he noticed in the beginning when he started working with the, the ensemble of Hora, uh, that he was demanding, listen to me now or do this please. And, and kind of like it suddenly did the things that he always criticized the theater himself and that he had to react to that. And that yeah. actually they, they were much better in breaking the rules of theater than him because he was saying like ah but behind the scene you have to be silent but they wouldn't be silent so, so they just ignored it uh, and he had to understand okay but that's actually maybe that makes sense or not only as a social project but as an as an artistic and aesthetic uh, questioning of theater and the apparatus of theater mm. yeah yeah and, and also you mentioned of course back to back theater and um, I think it is a, a time where we do question everything and we have to find our relevance. Um, how is the situation in Germany? Are people going to the theater? Um, um, is the experience the same? I speak to many people here and they say, you know, I look at a play now and somehow it doesn't touch me, it doesn't reach me. Maybe before Corona, the time of Corona or COVID, it would. Um, how, how is the situation um, in, uh, in, in Germany? Well, the theaters are obviously open since, since a while now. And I think it's like in, in general terms, um, um, uh, it seems like a lot of audiences come is back to the theaters. But uh, I would say, and I'm not sure it's it's empirically it's true, it's mainly more my my private uh, empirism uh, uh, or statistics, uh, that um, it was more difficult for, for theater it's more difficult for theaters and other events to get an audience back for things that you don't expect. So what is be what works best is is performances where people kind of already know what what they get because they know the artist well or they, they know the, the the play or whatever. Uh, they have less struggles getting audience back than than uh, things where you also as an audience member might take a risk because you don't know what's going on. Or it, it, so so that's of course for the kind of theater I'm writing about a big problem because that's kind of like the characteristic mm -hmm. that you usually don't know how the evening will go even if you know an artist. So I think that's also a little bit getting better but I think um, uh, uh, the, uh, the willingness to take risks might have been a bit, a bit uh, might be a bit reduced still at the moment. Mm -hmm. On the other hand I would say um, of course, and, and many people have uh, talked and written about it, and Claire Bishop, of course, I also quote in the book, and, uh, and on the, the question of participation uh, has, has changed in theater. There's actually quite quite a lot of audiences that, that enjoy participation now, which maybe some, sometimes is also a problem because I think participation is not as such a good thing. I mean, I think participation is an important feature, but participation might be also 
fake participation if you just follow, you know, if you just have a choice if you can go to the left or the right, but some director pre-thought both ways for you and then you are just performing uh, free decision or you're performing participation, but you don't actually get it. But I would say that's, that's quite changed that actually a lot of audience is very fond of it. And, and I think maybe one consequence of COVID in degrees, two degrees also that um, um, all, a lot of people want to be part of it and talk themselves, which I find quite interesting. I've seen performances where the audience took basically over, which was really legitimate because you see like people really have a demand to uh, uh, to speak. They might miss uh, have, have missed this uh, over the years. And also uh, um, a renegotiation and uh, of um, social encounters and and um, yeah and dealing with each other uh, seems to be happening in some in some parts. And maybe that's an also a job of theater to see like okay how how do we interact again uh, after after these years of uh, strange encounters that are behind us. Yeah, yeah, and um, as you say, there's the one that we expect anyway, and that perhaps has a time now and a time of uncertainty, but um, the artists you write about, and I quote some more, the London Rebel Clown Army, you know, and of course, Reverend Billy Yesman, um, and, and the Black Tent in Seoul, um, art makes make arts policy, and so many, many others, the Teatro de Negociation, the Rimini Protocol work, um, all significant work that is radically different from the expected, from the was things we already know. Um, you mention also a lot Milo Rao, and um, he uh, emerges as a major force in the moment, you know, um, also in contemporary theater. Tell a little bit, what, what do you think about his work? I, I, I would say I'm, I'm, well, on one hand, I really admire Milo, Milo's um I mean, his work, his, his strength, his presence, and I think he's really also, he's very important also as a public intellectual. So, so and, and he challenges theater all the time. So I think that that's, he has really does, is doing an impressive work. Personally, I think um, um, I'm most interested in the work that he did uh, uh, um, mainly some years ago, and well, it reaches also in, in, in current works, uh, where he was staging trials and tribunals uh, like uh, the Moscow trials. Yeah, talk um, a little bit about the project. People, I'm sure people have not heard of it. Yeah, so the, the Moscow trials uh, is a piece like now 10 years ago, and obviously it would not uh, be possible, not only at the moment, but in the last five, six, seven years already not have been possible anymore. And um, there were, were three famous trials against artists, curators, etc., cetera, in, in Moscow in the 20, 21st century. Uh, two against exhibitions that dealt with the religion and the third one the very famous uh, case against pussy riot uh, uh, after their performance uh, performance uh, stunt in 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 the uh, in the church in, Mos in moscow after which they were imprisoned so this was the the world famous case so so the, these three cases all related uh, to the freedom of art versus the freedom of religion but one could say actually maybe rather uh, against uh, that religion was also used just to 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 uh, shut down critical artists, and what Milo Rao did, he he created a, in the Sakharov Center in Moscow a, a, a courtroom, and uh, all the protagonists in this were protagonists that were really involved in these three cases, and the three, these three cases were reopened, so to say, each for one day, uh, with artists, theater critics, uh, uh, curators that were accused or even uh, uh, sentenced. Uh, or uh, acquitted uh, in, in these cases, but on the other hand, also um, orthodox activists, right-wing TV moderators from the other side, so to say, as prosecutioners. So it was really an, an, an a heavily agonistic situation in this case. I think it's like a textbook example for what one could mean with an agonistic theater. Uh, all these people in a space uh, with the real dramaturgy. Real advocates and real judges yeah, Artistic. partly a real, real one, but partly also the uh, the the advocates were um, were curators and theatre critics or uh, TV right wing um, activists. So it's also the the prosecutioner was um, um, was a very well known uh, right wing TV moderator and member of parliament uh, at that time. So so this is really like so it was an extremely intense work. There's a, a, a good uh, documentary Milo made about it, uh, and most people because it was a very small situation there. So so people know it of course from the film and not from the 
uh, usually from the uh, from having been there. I wasn't there either, but I know several of the protagonists, and it was it was so so it was really an intense situation where the, and, and theater was the only place where this kind of uh, open conflict could happen at all. Outside, it was already a situation in the, in, in society where this would, could not have been happened anymore. This encounter, and uh, and also afterwards, not Mila was. Uh, forbidden the entry to Russia afterwards. And so it was really a moment where theater could offer this kind of space. Um, and it was very important. Also, I, as I said, I know, know some people involved there, uh, protagonists in there, and it was also important for them to have the chance to kind of like tell the story and to have this conflict also. I mean, it was also hard to be confronted with with some right wing activists and so on, but they they wanted this chance there also. And then they, they needed this this opportunity to have this um, conflict staged. So I think that's that's a work I really find very impressive. Uh, I would say with some other works of Milo, which are politically very interesting and always very very challenging and intelligent. But uh, as a director of of other of his other plays, he is um, I would say more on the side of Stanislavski than of Brecht. So he creates situations which are. Um, um, very powerful in also emotionally engaging the audience uh, and and uh, uh, and in a way i would say uh, a bit um uh, sometimes maybe maybe taking the audience as hostage of certain of, of certain emotions and feelings and i think that's that for me is a conflict in terms of when it comes to that which is totally fine um, aesthetically uh, of course why not uh, but if it comes to political theater i think um Emotions are important as part of it, but uh, but uh, I think uh, you know, like uh, um, like a kind of domination uh, to the to the director is, is in a contradiction to the idea of empowering an audience to own thoughts, and I think that's an interesting conflict in his work, um, which which we also discussed uh, with each other and. and um, uh, on the other hand, I must, of course, that's part of the reason why he's so, so successful, because he gets his audience and also emotionally very strongly. But here I would be, uh, let's say, in the classic conflict, I would be on the side of Brecht and think it's about uh, making an audience understand structures behind things and, and, and to, to um, uh, also rationally understand uh, what the situation is and, uh, yeah. and, uh, and not... Um, uh, hitting them with them with a Stanislavski bat over the head, uh, and he does it very well. I mean, he's a, he's an amazing director. <laughs> Yeah, and, and in a way, what a great idea, instead of the traditional way, which is, you know, the dominant way that a writer sits in her or in his room, and they sit in the room and write a play, and then hopefully it gets selected, and then it's put up with actors on the stage, and people pay and come, and then go home and are entertained. Uh, he uh, took a real-world situation, like uh, um, the trials that never happened against Pussy Riot because they were put into jail right away. On the Congo Tribunal, which he created about a Swiss company um, that was actually killing people, you know, for for minerals, the rare minerals in the earth are lying and are destroying the planet. And um, he did this, or um, his work in Matera, where he put activists uh, um, of uh, farm workers, of, of uh, seasonal workers, immigrants uh, on stage, worked with them. They played Jesus. So the idea of a, a trial, or the idea, as you also mentioned, the idea of um, of summits, of parliaments, Rimini Protocol staged in a theater, a, a climate uh, a change summit. We just had also um, a parliament with uh, um, Michael Clear with us here. We talk about it. So it's something is happening. Something is different. And it is more interesting. And it asks and opens um, an opens question. What What is the play? What is the work? What you have seen where you felt that that changed you and that um, that that. Uh, um, it was a, a powerful that uh, of all the the the, the great uh, things we mentioned, or, or maybe something you saw before the book came out. What? Who are you following? Well, I mean, I think still that terrain is uh, it's a bit more difficult to say for the moment because it really, I think, a lot of things uh, and just reformatting. There was a lot of works that were shown that should have been shown years ago, and you know the situation. So I don't really. No, I mean, I'm not. I'm not sure. I have a really a grip on where we are now. Um, but um, to just talk about a very recent example, I think one of the most um, impressive and and uh, works I've seen uh, for quite a while is uh, Florentina Holzinger's um, uh, Ophelia Got Got Talent at the Volksbühne in Berlin, which is also, I think, the 
the talk of the town, so it's not uh, not even a very original thought that I'm offering here. The, I'll talk a bit, but nobody has seen it here. Um, yeah. No, uh, Florentino Holzinger is a, is a, um, a choreographer and a theater maker from Austria, and uh, she she is a, well very clearly a very feminist theater maker, but also let's say a, a very physical theater maker. So she so in her works always um, 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 what is the English word um, uh, um, how how do you call the in, in circus people like um, on on acrobats. or acrobats and uh, and um, and uh, like like a very sportive very extreme versions of sport. And 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 hanging in 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 ropes and so on play a role. So so she kind of creates a situation which is somehow between uh, uh, between circus game show, um, but also very very heavy physical encounters with an all women cast. So so she she really creates and it's difficult. You see, I didn't write about it and I didn't formulate it yet. So you see me a little bit stumbling to describe it because it's a it it is a. It is an event. It's a theater show uh, about um, very different uh, women on stage with very different bodies, uh, and and it creates a more. It doesn't really have a narration. It creates an experience for an audience over I don't know two and a half hours uh, of of very physical encounters of scenes that are um, might offend you because they are very physical or it's like she putting some needles. For, so she's also very Austrian. Let's say Viennese in in terms of like body art aspect. But what she creates basically is a, I would say, a kind of community and stage, um, and and uh, a theater that is is really uh, creating unexpected situations. And it's on the same stage that um, twenty years before Christoph Schlingensief was showing, um, uh, or fifteen years ago, I don't, I was not when it was exactly <laughs> fifteen years ago, uh, Christoph Schlingensief was showing Kunst und Gemüse, another work which was like having all kinds of people on stage, very chaotic. Florentina is on stage herself, as Christoph was on stage himself, and directing and changing the mm -hmm. own thing again. And uh, and it it, it it jumps from a game show to a revue to very well choreographed uh, uh, dance scenes and so on. So it's really a, a spectacle in a way, but uh, at the same time, very intelligent, very political, uh, very uh, confrontational. Um, yeah, it's quite a... Quite an event, but I, I I realize that I'm lacking a little bit the words yet to describe it. But maybe that tells you. something about the kind of work that she's doing. Yeah. You also write about Stefan Kegi from the Remini Protocol, the uncanny, uncanny valley about the robots on stage, the experience of it. Or talk a bit about Susanne Kennedy, the coming society um, where um, you know avatars actually portrayed by humans, like things we don't really see here. Um, but uh, you mention in the book, and you all put it together in a in a form, in a context, you give all these performances kind of a, a landscape, a home where, where they are situated in. And so is Susanne Kennedy. Well, it, uh, it's a chapter because of course, what is happening now that more and more all the questions of the uh, more than human, of uh, non-human actors, of our relationships to the world in a, in a not so only human-centered world is coming on, on stage. So that's, that's important questions. And I would say theater is, um, uh, in, it's sometimes not the best place to ask these questions because uh, it, it, I think it's um, for the better or the worse, it's kind of a human centered uh, medium. <laughs> and, and, and so, so I see a lot of attempts to, to talk about the uh, more than human uh, concepts that, that kind of fail for me because they stay very symbolic. But there works like you mentioned Stefan Kegi with a, with a, with a robot who resembles a well-known German actor or the work of Susanne Kennedy that, that kind of find ways of discussing these topics. Susanne Kennedy um, yeah, produces shows uh, in an aesthetic, in a, in a very internet-y <laughs> aesthetic in a, in a, and, and her characters often are kind of avatars on stage in, in different relations and at the same time they're physical, they're, they're, they're real people. So you have the, the uh, you have an interruption of it, you have this idea of something that is like two-dimensional and and clean and and non-physical. At the same time, you have performers that start to sweat because they are in a complicated position, or they tremble, or you know, so 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 they, they break the situation and create a different kind of conversation. I would say there was a couple of years ago uh, a wave of uh, so-called post-internet art, also some this famous. Uh, uh, New York protagonists and, and other U.S. protagonists, and, and and this was usually in the realm of of video or, or, or 
um, or, or screens. And Susanne Kennedy for me is a post-internet art in the theater, which is an interesting contradiction and produce a, a friction and agonism in the images, I would say, uh, of, uh, of what she's talking about. Yeah, yeah, and in this kind of David LaChapelle like uh, glimmer and shine and uh, a supernatural, uh, futuristic um, 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 uh, um, anticipation of a future, as you wrote in the in your book, you know, um, theater um, it, it does not really. Uh, we present the future, you know, um, for the, what will come, but uh, we, we move towards the future and we to kind of try to get accustomed to it. And I think uh, um, your work, but also the work of the artist you 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 chose um, 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 really has something important to say. And I really encourage everyone who works in theater, um, studies theater, to, to, to have a look at what you think on your vast experience and you put it in a form, you made decisions, what to write about, to really have a look and see what, what Floria Malsaker um, um, thinks it's worth uh, to spend time with. Um, I also like, uh, next to so many other things we could talk about, you do talk about uh, Didier Eribon and um, who of course works with Edouard Louis. And both of them make the case that uh, the kind of old fashioned models of just working class and the, uh, uh, were, are no longer um, really working that are just about feminism, that is just about climate change. They, they're making the case that everything is connected, that we have to look at the world in a, a different way. Um, Edouard Louis, I saw a talk of him in Athens, you know, who said, when I look at talk at my father, you know, of course he was a victim of capitalism, of the Macron policies, but he also beat his wife. He, you know, didn't accept him as a gay son and uh, and um, and refused, uh, you know, to participate uh, in, in life or that perhaps might have uh, been a, a better family situation. So he says, so we can no longer look at the world and the categories. Perhaps we have been taught to by Brecht and others, or was the hopes of the living theater that the, theater is a way to help us to get a paradise uh, from around the corner closer to us that it really is a part of, of of the existence of life enlivenment as Andreas Weber called it and that we are life uh, beings like plants and animals here on earth and we are part of it no longer different and there is a constant struggle but theater gives us a way to look at these uh, um, conflicts about the meaning and I think that's as much as I like sports, why it is superior, because we really can look from different sides and uh, understand um, something we haven't known before. We learn something. Uh, maybe uh, as the closure of, of, of our talk, I like your epilogue very much. It's so short, it will be a couple of minutes, but um, if you don't mind, um, maybe um, maybe read, read, uh, read to us so we also hear your voice and the Cory Tamler translation. And thanks to Alexander Beverka, of course, and Antje for helping us to make that happen, uh, that translation of the book and uh, the publication of it. Yeah, thanks for mentioning Cory Tamla. She translated the book, so I also have, uh, um, yeah, I'm very grateful to her. And um, yeah, I will, um, I, I never do this, so it's a, it's a premiere for me to read out of the book because, you know, these kind of books you usually don't have a readings, but rather discussions, but um, so <laughs> thanks for this uh, this invitation. What kind of th theater do we need at a time when democracies are being dismantled, right-wing populism is on the rise worldwide, when social injustice continues to grow, wars are spreading, and the climate catastrophe requires all our attention? We could conjure up worlds gone by, old solutions. We could insist that everything has been shown, set, and represented as it used to be. We could wish the audience back in the darkness for an art in which the concepts of ethics and aesthetics are neatly separated, in which proscenium and frames still guarantee autonomy. Or we could understand present dangers as a mission for the theater. Unclear circumstances are a rich breeding ground for art. Permanent learning by doing, no time to sit back and watch. Start co cooking, the recipe will follow, advises Brian Eno. Precisely because optimistic forecasts are hard to come by at the moment, it does not help to bury our heads in the sand. The crisis of current social, political, and ecological systems is undoubtedly a threat, but it also holds an opportunity to gain more terrain for democracy. The world will be different, and so will art. In this situation, we need a theater in which agonistic confrontation is possible. A theater which throws itself into necessary conflicts beyond its own walls, 
fist, uh, fist race. A theater that pulls its weight in the increasingly intractable struggles shaping policies, politics, and everyday life, almost every day, everywhere on earth. While neoliberalism has recently gotten somewhat out of fashion as a persona, the extreme right has perfidiously and with some finesse taken over anti-fascist philosopher and politician Antonio Gramsci's concept of cultural hegemony. Gramsci describes how in order to win election, one must first struggle for cultural supremacy with all the communicative means at our disposal from classic newspapers to the common sections of virtual social networks to meme production. Public debates must be influenced may, uh, massively and for such an extended period that, of time that the social discourse as a whole is changed and ideological infiltrated. Electoral success itself is then only the final logical step. A gradual shift in what can be believed, said or done at the moment, most basic level must come first. As a response to such seductions of illiberal to right-wing demagogues, mere opposition is not enough. Standing up to them is important. Above all, however, other social narratives are needed. Narratives that are both daring and relatable, truly progressive alternatives. We must create our own new images of the future and fight for social discourse. Political theater can be a laboratory for developing with radical imagination, such new narratives and testing them on a small scale. Like Jonas Stahl, one can also call this counter propaganda. Quote, we should begin to develop fact-based propaganda narratives for our own. New narratives about where we come from, who we are, and most of all, who we can, still can become. End of quote. It's not enough to refute the lies of others. The truth also needs new stories and images with which it can be spread. The examples in these books show the manifold ways in which political theater today, together with its audience, invents such narratives, such images, but also new forms of social coexistence. There's no short or long organum that we could simply follow. We are in a phase of experimentation, of finding out as artists, as well as spectators. But there are numerous approaches to artistic work and social com commitments that make clear the potential of the encounter between art and political action. What is needed is an art that is self-reflective, but does not fall into the trap of pure self-referentiality. An art that does not take up political issues as heated cliches, yet dares to take clear positions and endures both internal and external contradictions. An art that does not regard its knowledge of the contingency of our world as an excuse to leave everything to chance, but as a mission to counter the arbitraries of life again and again with its own necessary designs. An art that not only demonstrates and criticizes the ills on this planet, but actively participates in making the world a better place as corny as that might sound. What theater can contribute to this is its special competence in bringing people together in situations that are at once peculiarly real and fictional, actual and symbolic. In the paradoxical machine of theater, we can be part of a social game and at the same time critically observe ourselves from the outside while we are busy understanding the rules, negotiating them, changing them, or even trying out completely different games. It's that simple and that complicated. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. And it's good to hear, I think, the voice of the writer. And you are also a writer, philosopher of theater, and we encourage you to even do more and write more about theater and your thoughts and your, your reflections. And I think it's an important book and a great contribution and an ongoing dialogue, uh, I think, discourse. And so you entered in the way the public sphere with your book and um, then we hopefully will hear voices that said, no, that's wrong, that's missing, that's what, else, you know, but um, I think it's a great signal you're sending here and, um, and you are, um, um, as Lehmann said, you know, you're, the, the emission and reception happens at the same time, that's, uh, 
the sign of the new new theater where we are in and uh, we would like to thank you for for doing this and all the work and also the art of assembly talk they were very significant especially also in the time of corona and covid uh, it brought in many people together and i also if you're intrigued by the talk today go back and go to the archive you can find it um the art of assembly website and these conversation that led also to this uh, a book, like Adrian Kennedy wrote this great book, People Who Led to My Place. These are the conversations that led to the book um, of Florian. So thank you all. Join us if you can tomorrow for our second uh, talk from Guadeloupe, uh, Histoire des Nègres by Edouard Glisson. And then on Monday, we have a place, we have a discussion about a great, uh, a great event that is cooking up in Boston about Ukrainian and Russian directors getting together um, um, about reaction to to the current situation. So thank you all. Thanks for Halwan, Thea, and VJ for hosting us. And uh, goodbye, Florian. And I hope to see you soon. Thanks so much. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah.